Hello everyone and welcome back to our series on energy modeling fundamentals with Honeybee. And in the previous video we worked, it was a long one to construct this energy balance from our single family home energy model. At the end of that video, I promised you we'll go over a shortcut to getting to these energy balances and we'll definitely do that in this video. And at the end, we'll do an exercise that I think will really build your intuition about what drives the energy use in various different types of spaces. So let's get into it. So first off, there is a much shorter way to get to this whole process of getting all of these energy terms into an, a thermal load balance and then to be able to plot them on a monthly chart like this. And that is under the Honeybee Energy tab, on, next to the model to OSM component that we've been using to run our simulation right now, there is another component called HB Annual Loads. And if I drag and drop this onto the canvas, this component effectively does the same exact thing that the HP model to OSM component does, but it's a little bit more specialized. So this, this annual loads component is only for the case that you want to run an energy simulation and get out monthly loads or monthly energy balance like what we've been previewing on the monthly chart here. So it's not really meant for more sophisticated types of studies. You're not going to get any hourly plots out of this. There's a, certainly a lot of things that, that this component can't do that the model to OSM component can do. So the go-to component for energy simulations is this, this model to OSM component. But if you are only trying to get a, a sense of the loads of your, the buildings that you're creating, this annual loads component is going to be really useful to you. So you'll notice that instead of taking a model as input, it takes separately, it takes rooms and it takes shades. So we can actually go all the way back here to when we were first constructing our model. We have only one room, if I pull up a panel here, right? Our model is composed of one room that we're plugging into our HB model. And I can go and connect this up into our HB annual loads component. And it also requires, well, it doesn't require, but I can connect up my shades here that are separately going into my HP model. We can plug them directly into this annual loads component and plug those in here. And you see just the, the same way that the model to OSM component takes an EPW file for simulation, so does our HP annual loads. So if I go and I bring it over to here, I can grab the same weather file that I'm using for our, our model to OSM simulation. I could use it within here. And that's essentially, other than that, there's really just one more input. We have to set the run to true. So if I go and I bring up a Boolean toggle, and I go and I set that to true, you'll see the component will take about a second or two to run. And out of it, we are going to get something that is not all that different than what we've been working in the previous videos. I'm going to pull up a panel here. So there is a, a list of data here that's just called simply called total load. And you'll see it actually gives us cooling, heating, lighting, electric. And these are practically, I mean, not all that dissimilar from what we are seeing here out of the energy use intensity component. Maybe the values are off by a little bit. I mean, the, the heating is, is possibly a little less from this model here. But effectively, this component is running an optimized simulation to be able to give us these loads rather than having to go through a whole set of post-processing as we did with these components to get them. And you'll see that we get out data collections, monthly data collections for cooling, for heating, for lighting and equipment, for our hot water even as well. Uh, and importantly, we can actually get the energy balance out of this component, although you see by default it is null right now. So if I just connect the same Boolean toggle that's being used to run it to the run bow input, that will ensure that after it completes the simulation, this, this very quick annual load simulation, it's going to give me out this monthly annual load balance here. It's, this is essentially the same exact thing that is coming out of our thermal load balance is coming out of this component here. The nice thing also that this component will do, you'll never really miss any of these terms. Like for example, our model is a little specific in that it doesn't have gas equipment or process equipment. But if you did have a model that had those, those would be included in this balance. So this, this component can be used to always check that thermal load balance. And just to show you guys that I'm not lying here, let me delete those panels and I can bring this over and I can plug this balance here into the same exact monthly chart that we, we've been using so far. And if I plug that balance into the data of that monthly chart, you'll see it's effectively the same. I mean, there's a little bit that's, ha that's happening differently. I should say as a caveat that, that 
This simulation is particularly optimized. The reason why it's so fast is that we're skipping some of the extra steps that you would normally need to do for a full-fledged energy, energy simulation. But you come up with the same conclusion. It's, it's essentially the same idea. We realize that infiltration is the biggest driver of, of heating energy use in this single-family home. And importantly, if we can just do a comparison of time, I know we're comparing like peanuts to peanuts here, but let's say if I were to go and turn the canvas widget of the profiler on, you'll see that our Model 2 OSM, our, our full-fledged energy simulation took 14 seconds to run. This took a tiny fraction of that. And generally, this, this speed optimization will remain as you run larger and larger models. If you have a model that takes 30 minutes to simulate, the annual load is only going to take maybe three minutes or so, three to five minutes. Uh, so again, this is meant to be very, you know, give you a sanity check to make sure that the load balances of your models are correct. When you're ready for a production level simulation, you could run this model to OSM components, but this is really handy and really nifty for, for QA, QC in your model as you create it. And it is essentially the same thing. It is an energy plus simulation that's being run under the hood, just like what's happening here. Okay, all right, well, we have that shortcut here. I'm gonna connect back my, my older chart here and maybe just set this to false because we really don't need this component in this in this file anymore because we have already gone through the whole process of setting up the load balance with these components but i want you guys to open up there is another example file that downloaded with the with the food for rhino samples that we have here so again if you guys remember but back when we ran the installer in the very first video, or second video, I should say, there is a samples folder, and within there, there's Honeybee Energy samples that we ship with, with that installer. You can also find the link to the same file within the, the description of this YouTube video. You can always find the most updated one there. But I want you guys to grab one of these files so that we could actually use that annual loads component to, to kind of understand the different impacts that certain strategies can have on an energy model. So grab this, let's grab the shoebox annual loads. And again, for those of you who don't have the Food for Rhino download here, you can download it in the description of this video. And you'll see that this pre-prepared model, it's not all that complex. It's using the annual loads component, but it's essentially just an energy model being created with a some slightly different means than we created our single family home energy model. Instead of creating it using a, a solid geometry and immediately turning that into a fully simulatable room. We're actually con constructing the model up from individual honeybee faces. So we're specifying certain faces as, as indoors. We're using a special type of boundary condition that essentially means no heat flow or that it's an interior surface. And for the exterior surface, we're treating that differently and joining both the interior and exterior surfaces together into a single room. And just to make things a little clearer here, I'm going to turn off the profiler again. You guys will notice an old friend from our earlier videos. We're using this, this glazing by ratio component, or apertures by ratio, I should say, in order to specify a window ratio uh, on this exterior face. And if I go and I preview what this model is in the Rhino scene, I think I'm going to go back to perspective to easily see this. And uh, I could easily zoom to the model by typing Z. EA, DEA, sorry, in the upper uh, Rhino command bar, and that'll zoom me right in. And you can see this is just essentially a shoebox model, so this is meant to be one room out of a much larger building. The pink and the light colored surfaces there, these are the interior surfaces. But you can see the model is parametric. We have a slider that can change this window ratio from something small all the way up to almost fully glazed. We also have another slider that can help us rotate this model so we can study different orientations of shoeboxes. Uh, and then lastly, we have a little slider that helps us select out different types of programs. And you can see here, I've got the full list of programs that are a part of a hospital. I think I'll leave it by default on this hospital office to begin with here. And you'll see all this is going into oh, this, this room essentially that we're constructing here, the shoebox room, is going into the annual loads component. We have a weather file here. This is for a different climate than our single family home, but it's, it's Boston. It's a pretty cold climate in the United States. And if I go and I set this toggle to true, you'll see it should probably take about a second and it will give us the heating, cooling, lighting equipment, etc., for this shoebox. And you can see I already have a couple of monthly charts set up here such that if I were to go over to top view, 
I can see exactly what the what the heating, lighting, and equipment and cooling energy use is, and I get a visualization of the load balance that's associated with this with this shoebox here. And so the really nice thing about having a component that runs fast like this annual loads and having a parametric model like this is that I can do something in almost real time. I could change this this glazing ratio up from 40% and gradually move it up. And we can kind of experience in real time what would happen to the load balance of our shoebox as we did this. And you guys will see that during this process, right, the heating and the cooling energy use went up a lot. And we can understand that the reason for this is that the window conduction term became much, much larger here, right? We have in a fully, almost fully glazed shoebox where a lot of our heat loss is happening through that window term. And similarly, we have a lot of solar gain that is causing us to use a lot more cooling energy in months like July and August. And you'll notice that this can change as we change the orientation. Certainly our energy use isn't quite as intense as it is if we were on the south. For example, our heating energy use has actually dropped down a lot, probably because we have more solar gain in the winter versus the summer. And we could really get an intuitive sense about this in real time. Like what is the impact that orientation has on a building like this? And probably the worst energy use is, is kind of in the west or, or west or east. But when we get all the way to something that's north facing, let's say like at 360 degrees, that is again, not, not quite as bad uh, as, as the other cases. So, all right, so I'm gonna put this back to 45 degrees orientation, which is gonna be, essentially, I guess that's gonna be Northeast. And we'll change the glazing ratio back to something uh, a bit more reasonable or a bit less energy intensive, I should say. Uh, and you know we'll see our, our load balance will shrink immediately once we double click that and change that to 0 0.4. And now I wanna kind of get an understanding of, well, all right, this is a hospital office. This is what that, that profile looks like, that energy balance looks like for this, for this office. But what if I were to look at some of these other programs that uh, exist within the, within the hospital? So for example, what if we took a look at the corridor and so I can change this hospital programs. I can double click it, change it to one and hit the check mark. And we can see what the load balance would look like for a corridor. And wow, that's very different than an office. Uh, and you can see a lot of the reason for that is that we don't have any uh, electric equipment, it looks like. There's no computers in, in the hallway. You don't really have a need for those. There's still some lighting, but man, there's barely any people, which makes sense. You know, it's just a circulation space. And pretty much all the heating and cooling is either driven by some ventilation, some window conduction, uh, and some solar gain and some lighting gains. So again, a very different picture from a, a office. Let's see, what if we looked at something like the dining hall within a hospital? So that would be number two here in our list of hospital programs. And let's see, and oh wow, this is, this is almost at another extreme. So a lot more energy use we can see in a dining area than in an office. And we can see the primary reason for that is this big mechanical ventilation term, which if you guys remember me saying earlier, or I've said at least a couple of times in this series that Hospitals have a much higher energy use, and a lot of that has to do with this, this mechanical ventilation requirement. So we can imagine in a dining hall, we have a lot of people sitting close to each other, and according to with that, we have a very high people load too here. Uh, and you can imagine when you have a lot of people like that, you need a lot more ventilation to make sure that you're controlling for the spread of infection amongst those people. So that's why the mechanical ventilation is so high. In, in a space like a dining hall, right? You have all these people and you need to control infection as much as possible in a hospital. Again, you wouldn't find this in like a dining hall in an office, right? We're not nearly as concerned about infection control there, but this is the case for a hospital. Let's look at another space that would probably have a high need for ventilation. Let's say a patient room. So if I go down to 18, that should be, that should be the load balance of a patient room. And I hit the check mark. And we can see, ooh, and this is this is different now. So instead of being driven, well, all right, it's still mechanical ventilation. That's still the really, really biggest term that we have here. But in addition to that, we have another big term that's really consuming a lot of energy, and that's this equipment. 
And so you can realize that there's another reason, in addition to the ventilation you have for infection control, there's another big reason why hospitals are so energy intensive. And that's because you have really fancy pieces of equipment. You have things like MRI machines or within a patient room, you might have breathing machines or even things as simple as blood pressure machines. You're definitely going to probably have a computer in there for the nurses. So that's why it's between this, this mechanical ventilation and this electric equipment that's a big accounts for a big reason why hospitals are so more energy intensive than other programs. At the same time, also, like we can see, if we were trying to propose strategies for how to mitigate the energy use in the office of a hospital versus mitigating the energy use of a patient room, our strategies would be totally different, right? Like in, in the office, you might say, all right, let's make the windows a little bit smaller. Let's use some better windows uh, so that we mitigate the conduction and solar gain from those windows. But in the patient room, like the solar term is so incredibly small in the grand scheme of things. So if we're going to target the energy use of a patient room, we're best off really trying to reduce this mechanical ventilation one way or another. Probably the best strategy for that would be something like heat recovery, which you've heard me mention in earlier videos. And the other thing that maybe we can do, if there is any option for more efficient electric equipment, we should, of course, take that. But of course, we got to make sure that we got good equipment to keep the patients alive and stable. So that may be not as low hanging fruit as reducing this mechanical ventilation. All right, maybe we can look at one more interesting one. Uh, we can go all the way maybe to radiology, number 20 here. And you guys will see at this point, I think, uh, yeah, it's off the charts. <laughs> so radiology, you can imagine, has a whole load of special equipment, right? We're got uh, these x-rays, all this special type of imaging we're doing in a radiology lab. So that's why we're we're almost totally off the charts. It's the energy used in a radiology lab is pretty much only driven by electrical equipment and ventilation. Uh, the people themselves are kind of quite quite a blip in the whole grand scheme of what's going on in a, in a space like this. So again, hopefully you guys are getting a sense. If we were to go all the way back to our office, which I think was number seven, you guys can see in a, in a broad picture, energy balances vary widely. They, they're like a fingerprint. There's no space that has quite the same energy balance as another space. So it's really important to understand this when you are going, when you're drawing up your list of strategies that you want to propose for a given building type. Because I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, not on projects that I've worked on, but on projects that were built where people invested so much money in, in completely the wrong strategy. You had like a uh, something as intensive as a laboratory with a passive house wall, for example. And as you guys can see, a laboratory, if I were to take the lab in a hospital, which is number 12, that is putting on a passive house wall, maybe, you know, that would have been really nice if you did it for a residence, but that is a incredibly tiny drop in the bucket, barely doing anything compared to, let's say, trying to invest in heat recovery uh, for the large amount of ventilation that you typically have in labs. So, all right, so hopefully this puts everything in perspective. I hope you guys got a lot out of this series, and I, I encourage you to play around a lot with the Shoebox tool, tool. It's a really useful way of just building up your intuition about energy models. And then in the next video, we're finally going to take all this knowledge that we've learned about energy balance and about what would be best for a single family home energy model. And we're going to come back to it and actually start testing strategies to see how much energy they will save on our single family home. So thanks again for sticking it through this one, and I'll see you in the next one.